Now, hello everyone, and a very well welcome to the session. Uh, to begin, it seems polite that I introduce myself. I'm uh, Giuseppe Maggiore, so I'm kind of a cougar through and through. I started 18 years ago, I never stopped, and uh, going strong, so hopefully there's 30 years more uh, in store. Uh, lots of study, lots of academic study in computer science at the University of Venice. Uh, I have been a teacher, as a matter of fact. I still am part time, I'm going to have done. Uh, but I very recently went back to my roots as a developer and I became CTO of Hoppinger, the most awesome web company of the run study. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in this talk, I will present single page applications. Now, the title was much longer, so I, I kind of shortened it a bit. Uh, single page applications in TypeScript and React for headless Drupal. And the agenda of the presentation, now the, actually the, the motivation of the presentation is that, um, I don't know if you've noticed, if this is anyone's experience, but digital landscapes are growing in complexity. What was acceptable five years ago, which is, yeah, I mean, behind the corner yet, <coughs> Yeah, that, that, that seems almost child's play to us now. The bar is much higher. And um, so silver bullets, systems, frameworks, tools <coughs> that solve all problems, they sound, well, kind of unattainable anymore. So what was the best tool for the job? It becomes the best tools, plural, for the job. And so the headless architecture is one of the logical evolutions of an old style content management system as a way to complement it with more. This is the typical hybrid architecture. Now, this also tells that I cannot draw for the record, so my apologies for that, uh, but it's readable-ish enough. This is the typical architecture that we realized we built uh, at Hoppinger more and more. So we very often have, well, on one hand, the CMS, because yeah, that's needed. You have an admin interface that's fantastic, top of breed, best of breed. You have the workflow management. There's plenty of very complex stuff that's happening here. And there's a database, all right? But then there's other things. An exact synergy, for example. Server, somewhere that you need to pull to. Uh, there's a legacy database. Legacy, nice, right? Yeah, nowadays, uh, which company says, yeah, you know what? They have no digital system, so please <laughs> give me my first website. Ever happened to anyone in the last six months? Yeah, no, no. Uh, so there's legacy, there's data, you know, there's maybe 20 years worth of data collection there. Uh, there's machine learning processing and data science because someone had the idea of, of connecting it. And we have to, to turn this all into a single beautiful system for end users. How do we do this? Well, that's where single page applications come into play with something in between. Now, the single page application is yet another piece of the puzzle. It is, as the name suggests, an application. It's independent from the rest. It runs in the browser as a standalone application, which communicates with via an API, which I also call an aggregator here, with the rest of the systems to gather data and process them and show them to the end user. So, the agenda. We'll discuss the middle layer, the, the API aggregator. Then I'll show how to build some of this uh, in TypeScript and API. So I, I will leave PowerPoint behind in, uh, I think, about 40 seconds, so don't worry. Um, so the presentation, as, as it is, is almost over. So we'll move on to building the API in TypeScript, and there is a reason for that. Uh, then I'll show you some, some basics of React. I will try to build a simple uh, single page application in real time, so of course the limits of 40 minutes are, are kind of kind of heavy. Uh, then I'll sketch how this could be turned into a native application that shares the very same logic as the web application. Uh, and finally, we'll draw some conclusions. So the middle layer, what's the point, the goal of the middle layer? We have data. A lot of this data, so the definition of the pages, for example, comes from the CMS. But we have other data. For example, a very complex product database with all uh, categories, subcategories, and complex business logic and business rules and, and references between these different systems. So you might have uh, a page from the CMS that is related to a collection of products in a product database system, connected to users that are extracted from yet another system, yet another database. And what you want is that the website acts as if this is all just the data. It has to be joined together in a reasonable way. And, well, this, oh, oops, 
go back. Uh, so any lightweight, lightweight HTTP server will do in order to collect, connect, and enrich together all the data sources that are, that are available. The choice for today is ExpressJS uh, for a very pragmatic reason, actually. Well, uh, I mean, how many of you expect to be able to work without ever touching JavaScript in your lives? Raise your hand if you are so bold. No, no, right? So we can, okay, you can try, of course. Uh, so the idea is, okay, uh, so we know we have some languages which are unstable. So the idea was, okay, what, what do we, how do we build this intermediate layer? We build it in the same language as the front end, as the actual single page application. So this way the number of languages remains two, and secretly we can share code between this server and the single page application itself, which is yet another advantage. In larger projects, uh, at Oppinger we have done a lot with .NET Core, so if a large database is already present, but in many cases this, is, this, this would be a, a dramatic overkill. And the goal of this is not only to serve the single page application, so the actual pages and data, but also to do some caching and some uh, additional nice services. So moving to the code. <coughs> now this is a very simple Express.js project. Uh, the code in between is nothing exciting whatsoever. So here, it just responds to a single route and it gives you the page. That's, yeah, you know, uh, there is a, a single page here. In retrospect, it's kind of obvious. We have a single page application, right? Um, and so, uh, but, the, but the most interesting thing is that this application serves some data. And the data, and this is where a language like TypeScript plays an important role. By the way, can you, can you read it? Should it become bigger? It should become bigger. Bigger? No, wait, wait a second, sorry. Bigger? Anyone else? We still have some space to make it bigger. <laughs> but have to stop. All right, so uh, the nice thing is that this language allows us to start saying what things exist in our system. So it's not JavaScript, it's TypeScript. There are types in it, and we define them. And so the compiler knows, we, we, we make a deal. This is a, a deal that we make with the compiler. We say, you know what? Whenever I say that something is a course, it must have an ID, a name, and points. And whenever something is a lecture, it has an ID, a name, and a description. That's a handy, that's a handy way of, of, of asking the compiler, you know, keep, 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 keep on the lookout for me. And, uh, a very simple example of this <coughs> is that if I say that C is supposed to be a course and say it has an ID, okay, that's 10, it has a name, and that's uh, uh, introduction to programming, and then we have study points. I just took a random example, you know, and the study points are three, then I get an error. Can you, can you see the, the red the squiggle of annoyance there? You know, that, that's, and, and, and if, you, if you actually have a, a, a something in, in watch mode running, you know, you get red text. Underneath, in, you see, it's, it's red. And uh, I think there's even brighter red above for the actual error. It's, it's there above. Oh. oh, we missed it. Ah, anyway, and the nice thing is that then, then you get this, this compiler experience where the compiler and, and the editor, they, they talk to each other. And this is super handy because I mean, yeah, otherwise, if you can just run this code, and the code is, is valid in JavaScript, so you can simulate the JavaScript experience, I say, no, no, this is, this is anything, you know, and then it breaks later. This is going to break later, so you have to, to, to consider this to be a time bomb, you know, it's there. It's going to blow up at some point, you just know, you, you don't know when, it's nice. When you, when you give a demo, when the customer is doing something important with your project, so there are many beautiful moments for something to break. All right, so the moment you, you fix it, then you see the squiggle disappears, and the thing that's compiling it says, oh, look, okay, in green. That's nice. That's nice. Also, you know, you're tired. And, uh, you make less mistakes. Moreover, moreover, because the, the thing knows what, what's happening, then uh, it, it tells you things. And these things, you know, the, the, these icons, uh, the, the, you, know, you see that they're solid, you know, they're, they're solid blocks. Uh, this is kind of a, a visual way to say this really exists. I promise you, you can use it. <laughs> and uh, uh, if you say let x is c dot name, then you see it's happy and it knows that x is supposed to be a string. 
Oh yes, once again, it's kind of cool. And if we try to divide this by 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 something, you know, then, then it says no. It doesn't make any sense. What's what's a name divided by something? You know, this is insane. And then you get all, uh, more red, of course, because this, this, there's lots of stupid stuff in in, in this piece of code, right? Uh, and X, uh, yeah, it, it says it's a number, but it, it doesn't let this program compile, so you cannot run it, even if you want to, even if you, if you say, no, I am the, the master, you know, do, do it. There's no, it doesn't make any sense, right? So the machine is bound to logic, and therefore you are bound to logic as well, which is, again, nice. So these are the type definitions, and then what you can do, and this is a luxury, is you can build, well, I've built a fake database here uh, with... Uh, the courses, and there are three courses, basic programming, functional programming, algorithms, and data structures. And I've built um, a map, it doesn't matter what this is, but this is a way, you know, to have for every ID of a course, so for course zero, I linked a list of lectures, and I have four lectures for, uh, for, for the first course, okay? This is nice, because it's a very easy, very lightweight way of testing my assumptions about the single phase application without needing a lot of infrastructure. Because then, then testing uh, and making experiments becomes uh, well, the threshold is much lower. It's where you can test things. You can run them. And the only thing I have running on my machine now is, is just this server, the HTTP server with its mock API. That's nice. You c I could even deploy this, you know, and there is no data, of course, but who cares? Uh, I, you could change the data in, in these structures. But for the moment, I only built two API endpoints. One is get courses which is a promise of immutable list scores, and, well, oh, there's a debugger that says Marco, and then after two seconds, Polo, so I can delete this. Uh, but this is something, a, a, a side effect of this luxury, because my API is built in, it, 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 so the, the suckiness is built in. So this is an API that will never be faster than one and a half seconds. I know why this is awesome, because if you run an API in your machine, is it realistic? You, do you get realistic timeouts? No, you don't. So you build something under optimistic assumptions. But now, what we've done is we've built a bad API right away. This looks like an API that, that is running, uh, you are in the, you know, when you, when you make an API call in the train somewhere very far from a big city, you know? And you win. And so we built the suckiness in. That, that's, that's great. Uh, and we could make this even worse. We, we, could, we, we could throw a random number and make it fail, which would actually be arguably much better. So an API that fails on purpose. It's local and it fails. And that's great. So we have control over all these things. We, we, could, we could just say uh, we could have a counter. Yeah, let, let's build it in, actually. Let counter, and it starts at zero. And then uh, if counter plus plus uh, modulus, oh, wait a second. Modulus uh, 5 is equal to 0, then we resolve it, and otherwise we reject it. Uh, uh, better gateway. Yeah, you know. And look, in, 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 in this mock, we have the power to, to easily define how things are going to break and how often. And I mean, th th then whoever is going to build the application. Whoever is building the front end is being, will be confronted right away with how does your interface respond when the API doesn't give you back data. Have you ever seen a spinner that keeps on spinning? Yes? Hopefully. Waiting for a miracle to happen, you know? And the, the API has failed already. It's a long time, you know, the spinner, you know? It bravely keeps on spinning. <laughs> yes? <laughs> so now, at least... Uh, but, but, but that's a typical mistake because you test it locally, it works. You test it a million times, and every time it works. So you have this statistical model in your head that says this is going to work, but it doesn't. And now, yeah, every five times, the, the junior developer, whoever, or, or the, you know, a developer who just had a child and hasn't slept well for the last six months, you know, this kind of this, this kind of situation. There are many good reasons, you know, to make mistakes and forget things. Yeah, it's right. They are going to see it. They, are, they will be forced to see it and to take it on early in their development cycle. All right. Uh, so this is about the API. Now we have a, an excellent API that sucks exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But why TypeScript? Well, uh, one, and it's kind of JavaScript, which is nice, because uh, once again, 
the JavaScript is uh, one of these things, like, like the mentioned in the Netherlands, you know, it is as it is. It's a fact of life. You can complain about it, you can be unhappy about it, but still, it's not going to change. Uh, TypeScript is like JavaScript, so it leverages existing JavaScript knowledge that almost everyone has, but we have first class tooling instead of typing. Instead of typing means that as you write thousands and thousands of lines of code, then whenever you make a mistake, the compiler, a, 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 mal a, a badly structured something, it tries to access a field by, oh, the most fun one, capital letter instead of uh, non-capital, you know? Instead of saying, yeah, you know what, I trust you, master, I, I will do, you know, because the machine is, is very obedient. No, no, it has critical speed, which is much better, of course. There's no, it doesn't make any sense, because the name is, is, is with a small letter, not with a capital letter. Uh, so we enjoy first-class tooling and static typing, which prevents a lot of mistakes. So unit testing kind of disappears as a need, because every type definition is a huge unit test over everything you've written. Uh, it has a strong functional core. Is my very personal opinion, but I think functional programming is absolutely awesome, so I love it when a language does it well. And uh, it is a rich type system, which um, I, I want to show for a moment, because the language does have a couple of truly awesome things. Uh, <coughs> if you'll forgive me, because uh, this is something that's really cute. Uh, you could say that uh, a type, uh, a, a person is either a customer with, yeah, let's just say it as a name, uh, or an employee, and uh, you know the, the the bar here. It just means literally or, so one or the other. And the employee has a name, uh, but but it also has a he also has an ID, and uh, that uh, he or she has an ID, and that that's another string. And suppose that we had a function somewhere, a uh, function uh, f that takes as input a person p. Then the type system knows a lot. So if I say p dot, look what it says. It says that there is a name. It says that there is k, which is k stands for kind. But what isn't it saying? There is an id. Why? Because it might very well be that there is no id. But look what happens if I check the kind to be employee. Then inside the then branch, now I have an id. I mean, seriously, this, this is awesome. And if you, if you say, no, no, but, uh, uh, oh, uh, look, and if you say true, uh, return true, and you check p dot, oh, no, there's no idea anymore. Because if, if, the, if, if the condition was true, then we would have returned. And so, yeah, now we know for sure that k is customer, not employee. Because inside the if we return. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> All right. Uh, so then we have the... API, uh, but, okay, so we have logic, we have simulated the server, it breaks nicely, we have a strong way to identify the data structures, uh, how do we render it? With React. React is, uh, I call it quick, I, I, I mean quick in the sense of, uh, so the feeling of speed and high performance is excellent in React. Also, the amount of data you get with an API call is not a whole page. An HTTP request will result in sending bytes, hundreds of bytes. So the latency is much more significant than the bandwidth. So you send so little data that it takes longer to open the channel than to send the data itself. So you open the channel, and that takes a little bit of, of, of handshake. So actually, uh, if you use a WebSocket, then, then, then you can actually have an application that, that has almost no transmission to speak of. So that's very nice. So it means that it's light. It's light for the for, for it's light for the browser. It's light for the bandwidth, and it allows you to build lots of logic in the rendering layer. So you can build an application which is more intelligent, which has a, a, a richer dialogue with the user. I will show an example of, of one of, of these applications that is very dear to me. Uh, now the core idea is that there are containers that have state properties and a way to render themselves. That's all that React does. So here's one. No, here's one. So this is such a container. I called it courses. Uh, so we're going to show the data coming from the API. It's going to be a list of courses, you know? Uh, and the courses are a React component. And the React component is a generic type that takes as input the course properties and the course's state. 
the properties are parameters that are given to the component to control how it renders itself. And the state is the state of the component, is the information that is stored locally by the, that is stored locally in the, con in, in, in the courses itself. For example, results of user interaction or whatever. Oh, no, we, we should delete this. Uh, then there is a render function, and this render function has access to the properties. And, and you can see that these are, uh, these are the properties. So they have type courses props, and there is nothing in here besides the children, but that, 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 that's not very relevant for us. And the state, and that's also empty. And what we return in this case is just a piece of text, which couldn't possibly be anything else than hello world. Uh, let's add a, a few exclamation marks. And then, oh, yeah. Yes, if you don't believe me, how many exclamation marks should I put? Five. Five. We do not know each other. No, at least we didn't make any <laughs> on this beforehand. Uh, so that's five. That's not a recording. Okay? <laughs> all right. Uh, but what's even nicer is that uh, we can put here uh, all sorts of... Um, uh, all sorts of uh, of DOM uh, elements. So we could have uh, list items, uh, list item one, etc. So I will later add some bootstrap to make this to, to make this less ugly. But I have no pretense that what I'm going to show is aesthetically appealing. You know. So I'm very grateful for the amazing professionals at Hoppinger that can turn my code <laughs> into something beautiful. But that's not going to happen today during this presentation. <laughs> All right? Uh, but anyway, so here, here, here is our list. Once again, not very exciting. But let us put some logic, some state. And in the state, we will say that the state of the courses state, of the courses component, are the courses to render. But these courses come from an API. So I could be tempted to say, OK, this will be um, a list of course. Of course, okay. And then in the state, he says, "Ah, and look here, it's complaining." Yeah, that's handy because now it's telling me, "Okay, you promised me that the state will have courses, but you haven't put any courses." Okay, so I could do something that is not forgivable. I could say, "Yeah, you know what? In the beginning, it's empty." This is not the way to go. Why? Because, I mean, an empty list of courses is an empty list of courses. It might be a school that just started, you know, so there are no courses. But that doesn't mean that it's loading, you know. But we want to load them. And we cannot load them right away. Why? Because it might fail. So we need to say that the courses in the state of the component must be richer. It must be, well, either the courses or loading. Or an error. This might very well be that we don't get anything in. And so now, well, in the beginning, we simply say, no, in the beginning, this is loading. It makes perfect sense. When the component uh, has mounted, so the component is actually being fully initialized, then we say, OK, now, you know what? Let's load the courses. So get courses. Uh, and we give it a callback that is called when the courses are loaded. And courses uh, here, this, this variable will be the courses that have been loaded. And now we can store these courses into the state. And we do this by invoking set state. This is a little bit weird, so I'll uh, spend a moment on, on this. The reason why we call set state is that whenever the state changes, and React needs to know that this has happened because this way the component can re-render itself because the rendering depends on the state and the properties. So we need to say to React, hey, here's the new state. Do your thing. So not only the state will be saved, but the rendering will be triggered again. So the component also refreshes itself visually. This is a data flow architecture if you're interested in the kind of fancy name. All right, uh, so, uh, and, uh, well, let, let, let's see when this happens. Um, the 
forces have arrived. All right, let's see if it's compiling. It is compiling, it's happy, very well. So let's turn the console on. Let's refresh this. And yes, there you go, the course is arrived. Have you seen the delay? Very important. Okay, cool. Now we know stuff is, is happening. Let's present it to the user somehow. And here, um, well, we could say uh, if the state <coughs> dot courses, well now I have to check what they are because uh, there is nothing in here. There, there is very few methods that they, they don't really mean anything. So I first have to check, um, is, it, is it loading? I notice that I can, I can ask the compiler to tell me, okay, what are the options? And, and, and it tells me, which, yeah, once again, it's handy. Because uh, what did you, um, when preparing this, I actually put loading and three dots, you know? I had forgotten of it completely. It was nice to realize, oh my God, this would have been painful. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay, and we return um, loading. Uh, and here, if the state.courses is error, then we say error. Uh, uh, please refresh the page. Okay, this, obviously this is not what you should do, but you know, bear with me. This might be a button or a timeout that starts, whatever. Um, and finally, well, when we get to line 27, we are certain that the courses are actually the list of courses. So we, are, we have handled everything else. And now well, we can draw them as, as list items. So you could say uh, this dot uh, state dot courses dot and now we have much more stuff because this is the whole list uh, I will turn it into an array because uh, react is much happier when when you render primitives uh, and we have a course here and what I've done is uh, I've defined no 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 let, let, let's keep this simple um, let's put a list let's put a list item yes and in this list item let's just put uh, the course name All right, now it's loading. Bam, the course is. Okay, there is something that we haven't done yet, uh, but uh, <coughs> let's. Uh, we're not handling errors yet. Eventually, someone is going to notice that there's an error. So we can say catch on rejected, and then we set the state to simply store the fact that, yeah, the courses contain an error. And so we should handle it, okay? That's uh, so now it's complete. Now, now the, the the handling is complete, okay? But of course, the courses have more information than just this. There is more information than than, than, than just the name for a course. Uh, but we don't want you know to have all this data inside the courses component because the courses component is kind of doing what, what, what's it doing? If you think about this in terms of, of solid programming single responsibility principle, then the courses, what are they doing? They are managing the courses, plural. That's what they're doing. They're getting the API, showing eventual error messages, showing the loading thing, uh, managing errors, and then when it has the courses, it just says, okay, let's render the courses, but the management of the individual course, that should happen somewhere else. In another component, which we will call, very unsurprisingly, the course component, which I have written already. Um, how much time do we have? Ah. <coughs> yeah. So, the course component, and you know what? No, this is too much fun. Let, let's do this. <laughs> okay, so this uh, is a single course. Okay, and what we can do, I imported this component already, I can say, okay, you know what? Draw a course here. Now, what happens is that we're loading and we get the course component. So the course component is now behaving as a DOM element, but it's not really a DOM element. It's, 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 it's a custom element that, that contains DOM stuff itself. And now, the course, well, what for information does the course need to know what to render? It needs to know which course it has to show. And the course, so, the, the, so we have a course, but which one? That's data, that, can, that data comes from the API. So we add to the properties the actual course, which has type types.course. 
So we say, okay, the, so the course component manages, renders a course that has come from the API. This component has no state. And now we can just render it. We, have, uh, we don't have to do any, any error management because error management has already been managed by the courses component. So this component will always get data, and the data will never be broken, which is nice, you know? Um, and so we can say that uh, the name is this.props.course.name, and uh, the points are the points. But look, if you look at the console, then there is, the, the, now it's whining. It's whining because when we instantiate the course, we are not saying which course needs to be rendered. But which course needs to be rendered? Well, the current one, which is called C, which comes from the array. And now, yeah, okay, it's not formatted, but let's get it. Bear with me. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, I've accepted, you know, that whatever I do is ugly. Uh, so, and that someone else will fix it for me. So I, I, I apologize that you are subjected to this. I, I don't even try anymore. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so suppose now that we wanted somehow to select courses, to do something in this component. And now I will just sketch the solution because uh, time is slowly running up. Uh, so now uh, we have this component here, and it has state. And in its state, we want to hold a selection <laughs> by of the current course. So that's kind of a menu of different courses, and we want the user to be able to select one of them. And the selected course, uh, we show its lectures, for example. Let's begin by extending the state of the courses component so that it also holds the selected course. And the selected course, well, we, you could say, okay, this, it's, it's a course, but not always, because you, you might also have no selection whatsoever, right? When the application has just begun, then you have no selection yet. And this implies that uh, when the state is initialized, the selected course starts at none. Makes sense. Then, we want to allow the course to decide when it becomes selected. So let's jump into the course component. Let's at least put some extra divs here. You know, let's make this almost decent. Okay, and let's say that when you click on the, on the name div, then uh, we want for the course to be selected. But what should happen when the course is selected? Well, the course doesn't know it's selected, nor does it really care. It just wants to tell the parent, you know, I have been selected, do your thing. So let's put in the properties of the course an event handler, which will be uh, uh, select me, which is just a function, it takes nothing, because it just says, yo, select me. And so it says that there are no parameters, there, there's no modifiers, and it doesn't give anything back. And when we click on the name, then we call from the properties, select me. Let's also put here. <coughs> Let, let's, let's put some, uh, some debugging stuff. And now if we go back to the courses, now you see it's complaining. Why? Because it says, yeah, but you have to tell the course what happens when it gets selected? So selected, oh, sorry, no. Select me will be a function. Let me reformat this a little bit. Okay, select me will be a function that, well, will store in the state that the current course must be saved. Selected course must be saved as C. And also, to be sure, let's also put, it's a bit of an ugly debugging technique, but... Uh, right? Now, let's see what happens. Oh, let, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's make a, a heavy optimization. <coughs> 
So the API, is, uh, we bought a better server. The API is now 500 milliseconds. Um, now let's, let's refresh this, okay? Let's click, bam! Can you see Marco Polo? Uh, for the record, I come from Venice, you know, and Marco Polo was Venetian, so I also like it. Um, all right, so it, it's working, and now when it says Polo, what's happened is that we now have a selection. So we, we now have a selected course. And of course, you, you, you would obviously want some, some, some better way of marking this, but I would just go the ugly way of saying, okay, if this dot uh, state dot selected course, uh, oh look, well, why can't I say dot ID? I want to see if this is the course that I can put, I don't know, an extra div that says this is selected. I'm just debugging, this is just a debugging phase. But why can't I say uh, this dot state dot selected course dot ID? Because it, it might be none. So for the, any course to be selected, well, of course, the selection must not be none. And this dot state dot, this is right of an end, you know, of a logical end. And now, oh, <coughs> there's the ID. And the ID is equal to the ID of the current course. Then uh, we just draw a div that says uh, this course is selected. And otherwise, now we just, we just draw nothing. Okay. Once again, ugly, but by now we should have established <laughs> this <laughs> is the baseline. All right? And of course, based on the selection, the course's component might be able to perform yet another course, to load the lectures of the course, for example, to have a, a right column or whatever, or to have something that opens up to show the details of the course that, is, that has been open, to show its lectures, or to navigate. It is obviously possible also to do management of uh, routing, client-side routing. Uh, there is, yeah, this sample container. Uh, this sample is on GitHub, for the record, a slightly less ugly version of it. So after the talk, I give you the, the URL, <coughs> and, you can, uh, and you can check it out if you want. Okay, and then there's native, because the nice thing about this is that uh, we've built code, you know, code for loading stuff from an API to manipulate things. Maybe we've built logic into this. And this logic, it's 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 it took us work to build, you know. And now we have to translate everything into Objective C or Kotlin, whatever, right? So all the blood, sweat, and tears, it's been for nothing whatsoever. It's not nice. Or, I can simply say, no, no, let's keep all our React code and logic and let's recompile it for a native application. For which store? All of them. No, I do not do Microsoft uh, store anymore. But uh, uh, Android and iPhone are covered. And you actually get the ability to build a native application which shares all the code of the logic of your application, minus two caveats. Uh, the final elements, so uh, the input elements, image elements, etc. so the DOM elements for the native components are not the same, so you have to build the application in a parametric way. I guess that's going to be another point for another time. Um, and the style. The style sheets must become style objects. So all the styles for native application are kind of in line. It's, so we call them uh, cascading style objects because you can use the spread operator and then you get the cascading, but yeah. Um, all right. Uh, so we have built this in a lot of projects. So you could say that we have lots of experience with this. Uh, so in, in, a, in a project we built for GS1, uh, one of the coolest things we did was uh, to build a small uh, chess player because uh, they have all these weird offers, you know, of barcodes for customers, and it's kind so of hard for customers to know which set of offers they must they must buy. And customers typically spend more, but they're not happy because they get this feeling, yeah, we're spending more, but we don't know how to. So we build this tiny artificial intelligence, and it is a stronger, uh, a stronger artificial intelligence. It plays chess, you know, but with with commercial offers, and it finds the best solution, the best set of moves that covers the things uh, that the customer requires. But this tool turns in the browser. So one of the questions was, okay, so th th this is actually quite computationally expensive. So to run this on the server, it requires a huge amount of processing power, huge. But I mean, even the stupidest machine you can imagine, it can't play chess locally. So instead of rebuilding this server side, we, we just build it the And now you click and it shows you the partial solution and it looks very neat. And that, 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 they have the answer, you know? And you wait 30 seconds, but the point is, if a million people are doing this at the same time, you know, they don't have a million customers, but even if a thousand people are doing this at the same time, the server knows nothing about it. Because it's still happening, 
uh, on the customer's dime, if you want, on the customer's megahertz. Uh, uh, more projects. We've done it in, in lots of places. Uh, this is one I, I particularly love personally. Uh, it's, a, it's an artificial uh, teaching assistant uh, with a built-in interpreter and debugger. This is running code in the browser. It's a, it's a compiler we really built for C Sharp that is, is it's running the code on the left and showing the debugger in, in real time. And this debugger is super expensive uh, to run on the server, but the code validation is all happening locally. So this is all in the browser. My server knows nothing about this, what's happening. When I, when I click next, it saves the statistics of the results, but I see that's nothing. So I, I can have an interaction. I have hundreds of students. You know, we had this problem of there are 400 students desperately clicking during an exam, you know? Imagine the combination of someone who's 19 years old and in panic because of an exam, how many clicks per second they can generate with, with sensorless data. And, and the nice thing is that the server now gets a, 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 a tiny stream of a megabyte per hour of data because most of the interaction is local. It's happening on the students' machines. And we had computers that we would need like, to, to spend hundred, uh, about 60,000 euros a month of hosting fees if we had done this on the server side. So I guess it's also nice to not have to do that, you know. Um, so, yeah, and, 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 and more. And more. So lots. So, uh, so we've we've done this a lot. So this is not just an academic talk. You know, this, we've we've eaten this specific brand of dog food uh, ourselves. So headless architectures, uh, and of course your mileage may vary. This, this 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 goes without saying. But for us, it's offered lots of advantages. Uh, we can build large systems with different microservices on the back end composed together, and each service does its job and remains clean. And that's the beauty of it. Every back end service remains clean. It's not hammering until it does what it needs to do, it does exactly what it's supposed to do. It's simple, it doesn't break, and it's decoupled from the rest of the system. And there is much more logic in a single page application, which means that uh, there is less waiting for new pages. There is less processing power required on the server. And we can build a self-sufficient application that doesn't require a constant connection also to change pages, because most of it is, is, is local, is, is client side, and to work with far less data. So I hope uh, this has been uh, sufficiently exciting. And with this, uh, I would like to thank you very much. And, uh I would like to point out that there is, oh wait, no, yes. Uh, that uh, this year is the URL for the, for the, for the code, github.com slash hoppinger slash Drupal Jam 2018. Uh, and the cost of sounding a bit rhetorical, we are hiring. So if you like this kind of stuff and you think, is there some people that actually do this professionally and that might have a job for me? Well, you don't need to look very much further than a... <laughs> <laughs> and for any questions, I'm going to be here for the next 20 minutes. And uh, uh, there is my email, so make, make dice-create use of it as much as you want. Yes? <laughs>